Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's ThreatPost webinar entitled A Practical Guide to Securing the Cloud in Times of Crisis. I'm Tara Seals, Senior Editor at ThreatPost, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I'm excited to welcome our panelists, um, but before I do, I have a few housekeeping notes that I wanted to run through with you guys. Um, first of all, after our speaker presentations, we're going to have a Q&A session, uh, so audience members can submit their questions at any time during the webinar. There's a control panel widget that you should be seeing on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, there's an option for questions in the drop-down list. Uh, click on that particular tab to open it, and you'll see where you can submit your queries. Um, also, I'd like to note that the webinar is being recorded. We're going to be sending out a link uh, where you can listen on demand, and you can also send that around and share that with your colleagues. Um, all good stuff there. And with that, I'm going to introduce today's speakers. I'm really excited for our panel today. We've got Chris Hertz, who is CRO of Divi Cloud, and also Thomas Martin, who is a former CIO at GE and also founder of Nefosec. Um, they're going to provide a pretty deep dive into the current state of cloud security and how to avoid uh, disruption and chaos during times of crisis. Obviously, that's extremely applicable uh, for today's uh, situation. And a word about the agenda. This is uh, pretty much the outline of what they're going to go through. Um, basically, the overarching theme here is uh, we have cyber attackers that are trying to take advantage of the unprecedented changes that we're seeing in terms of how people work. Um, obviously, we have a lot more people working from home these days, and even the most experienced security staff uh, can find themselves wrestling with trying to get their cloud footprints up to snuff um, against the onslaught of all of the cyber criminal activity. So, uh, panelists are here to offer some practical guidance on tackling these so-called new normal challenges, um, and we're going to try to do that in a way that uh, goes beyond a simple 101 level. Apologies for that. And with that, um, I am going to hand it over to Chris and Thomas to begin their presentation. Welcome, Chris and Thomas. Thank you for being here. Hey, great. Thank, thanks for having us here. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, to invite us on. Uh, Thomas, do you want to introduce? This is Chris Hertz speaking. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer of Divi Cloud. We're a cloud security posture management company that uh, services the likes of folks like Spotify and um, and uh, uh, other great brands like Kroger and 3M. Um, and with me is Thomas Martin. Thomas, do you want to quickly say hello? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Tara, for having us today. But um, yeah, so Thomas Martin, I am the founder of Nefisec. We spend uh, our work with companies uh, working to ensure their secure adoption of cloud technologies uh, throughout the de you know, development and deployment cycle. Previously, I was with General Electric and uh, worked as a CIO and CTO across uh, many of the industrial verticals. So great to be here today. Yeah, well, let's... Let's dive right in. First of all, we, you know, this is a live webinar, so hello to everybody out there listening in. Um, we recognize this is a trying time for for everyone, um, and uh, thanks for making the time to to, to uh, you know, spend the next hour or so with Thomas and I. We're going to spend a bit of time talking about um, really, as was covered, you know, cyber attacks, uh, the pressure for moving to public cloud, what the increased challenges are, um, diving into to um, you know how how we're being equipped to deal with this, going into things like frameworks, and then really starting to dive into uh, towards the, the latter half of the, of the hour or the 45 minutes we'll be talking for, um, really specific things that you can do now to start trying to improve um, security writ large, but with a focus on cloud security during a time of crisis and a, and a time of, of, of distress like we are in right now. Um, Thomas, I'll be tag teaming, uh, but at first I wanted to just set the table. So again, uh, what we recognize is that even before the pandemic uh, struck, cyber attacks were on the rise and they are meaningful. And I'm going to be referring to uh, two different reports as we go through. Uh, the first is a 2020 State of Enterprise Cloud and Container Adoption Security Report that uh, surveyed uh, close to 2,000 participants during 2019, um, spanning all major industry verticals, organization size, and job functions. And the second is the 2020 Misconfigurations Report that we've published as well. Um, and both of those will give us some data to be able to, to work off of. So I just wanted to set the table there. Um, but you know, first and foremost, you know, I think that the, the point is that uh, cyber attacks, we went from, um, uh, you know, it cost $5 trillion in damage essentially in 2018 and 2019 alone. Um, and that was before uh, the mounting challenges of the pandemic. And 
And we've already seen, um, you know, increased uh, attacks since the pandemic occurred. So, you know, very, very early on, for example, news broke of the Department of Health and Human Services being hacked, um, you know, and after gaining access to their systems, the cyber attackers broadcasted a false claim that the U.S. government planned to introduce a national, nationwide lockdown, um, you know, sowing the seeds for confusion and doubt and panic amongst the general public. So, you know, be, you know one of the things is we were seeing this attack rise uh, earlier. It's, it's, it's progressed. Um, and functionally, if we look at our 2020 misconfigurations report, we went from 81 um, uh, major breaches to 115 between 2018 to 2019. And in large part, th this is because they um, it was a cloud services uh, data breach or other security instance. Um, so, uh, and 59% uh, confirmed that it was due to a misconfiguration. So, you know, big big stuff was happening already in part because of the move to the cloud. And Thomas, let me let me talk about that. Why why is moving to the cloud and and, and often to the self service model of access to the cloud putting increased pressure on on uh, organizations relative to cyber attackers? Can can you talk a little bit about that, what you're seeing in the field? Thomas, did I lose you there? No, sorry. Just I, I had put it on mute to make sure we didn't have any background noise, but <laughs> <No problem>. um, <laughs> try to be courteous and caught myself uh, in the in the in the uh, the mute. Hey, uh, but no, you, you talked about it a little bit earlier, and that was this has been an ongoing challenge. I think just in in everyone's overall journey, and we'll we'll talk about it more. But just right now, under this just overall heightened sense, right? It's it, everyone has made a huge uh, acceleration, if you will, especially in the areas of trying to uh, hold up having everyone working remotely. I've seen this major shift of moving VPN connections over to, to cloud-based resources, and that's just putting a huge strain um, on you know, individuals trying to make these moves and the configurations related to them. Um, and then I think, you know, there was even an article this morning, a couple of them, one even in the Wall Street Journal about with the, uh, particularly around funding, right? I mean, people are just under due stress trying to make sure that they're covering their bases financially. And it's just providing tons of opportunity for the hacking, uh, hackers at large to try to take advantage of people being under duress. And so it's just a combination between heightened uh, heightened stress as well as a rush which can uh, cause people to cause misconfiguration yeah and i think i think you know running up to this of course you know the pressure is already mounting because as we as many companies embrace public cloud you know what we saw constantly across our portfolio of customers was you had this bifurcation which customers felt like they had to embrace cloud because it drove you know, agility and um and therefore that would drive um you know experimentation and that would drive uh, you know, essentially innovation and therefore, you know, uh, competitiveness and, and profitability. And so if you didn't do those things, if you didn't embrace cloud and you didn't do it quickly enough, you would just die on the vine as, as a company. And so there was this push to say, let's say, let's go around security. Security is viewed as slowing us down. Let's sure. go around it. And so, so that was the pressure I think that was mounting, you know, already. And then to your point, we get into this new world in which not only are people now pressing into cloud because of all that, but now it's been, hey, everyone has to work from home. How do we use cloud services suddenly very rapidly where we weren't prepared to to enable that? You're having to adopt new services. And what we know is like, look beyond cloud, you have unsecured home networks and devices that are suddenly sure. now being forced on. There's disruptive communication channels, right? People are more often to, to sacrifice security for experiencing when they feel under pressure, which is your point. Um, we've got the rapid move to new technologies that has been that that velocity has increased more. Not it has not slowed down since this has all occurred. And all those things, to your point, look at you know just they they combine to allow things like phishing to become an even bigger driver, right? Because you think about well, I've I've got access to disruptive communication channels where people are under stress, and all of a sudden that email from the CEO that says, hey, I need you to log on to this this URL um, in order to access your payroll. Uh, or you won't get paid next week. Well, that's you're probably going to click that link, yep. <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> you got and it. and uh, and so yeah, and all those things I think uh, are these increased challenges. So in this world that we're talking about right now, you have this double whammy where you have, like you said, all this increased challenges plus what was happening with cloud, and now this combination is just a tidal wave that I think is is um, is probably like nothing else we've ever seen. Um, Certainly overwhelming for many. Yeah, um, and if you're out there and you're feeling that and you're listening right now, you're not alone, right? I mean, this is yeah. something that we are seeing. Um, and so what we've seen, and by the way, what we've seen over the last few, few weeks is that cloud is becoming ubiquitous. And, and in fact, if anything, 
Thomas, I think we've seen the, it, that, again, that velocity increase. Um, let me give you an example I, and tell me if you've seen this as well. I, I think I, I heard the rumor that Microsoft was actually running out of their Azure virtual machines for, for remote desktop workers in the cloud because the, the push to leverage that was so great. I don't know if you've seen other examples of, of sort of the, the rush to adopt cloud you know, in, in the current moment. Well, and I, I have heard similar, and I, you know, I think one thing we all need to realize, right? I mean, it's uh, ultimately these are other data centers, right, that that are running uh, running those technologies, and it's it's not infinite, but at the same time, uh, they are working to keep up. But you you take on a, an account not only um, those workloads that are remaining on prem, but the you know the hybrid connections out to potentially multi providers stack on top of that a number of SaaS solutions and certainly we've seen even some of the some of the SaaS providers not only struggling uh, you know such as Zoom right but struggling with this weight of this massive shift along with the inherent uh, potential security issues that come with it and look I, I think look ultimately employees don't intend to cause additional risks uh, but working under stress they can make mistakes and I think you know that's where we're going to talk I think a lot today right or about how not only do you have to have a view to those configurations, but also the ability to take some autonomous action to ensure that things get remediated extremely quickly? Yeah, well, and, and you know, I think that the other part that we saw as we looked at our data is that, um, you know, we are just, we're, that companies are rushing through the cloud national life cycle. And what that means sure. is that, um, that, you know, often, Companies again, as I mentioned, are ignore are, are circumventing or avoiding security because they think there's this false choice. They think that if they implement security at the same time, they will slow down. They can't go fast. And, and I think you know, the message that I've already heard you preach is you can have both the best of both worlds. You can move quickly, you can go big and go fast in the cloud, but you can do so in a secure way. And those things are not mutually exclusive. And 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 yet we see this that companies are making that false choice and they're rushing through without taking proper assessment evaluation steps to ensure that they have. Uh, continuous security compliance um and we see that you know it, it, you know in a second in, in a sense that that's leading to id professionals not being equipped to operate securely in the cloud and a few a few data points we we saw that uh through these surveys among enterprises using public cloud uh only 40 percent uh of respondents confirmed their their organization has an approach to managing cloud and container security in place just 40 percent um yeah. so 60 percent do not have a mechanism and then 45 percent of uh, confirm their organization does not have any of the common cloud security tools, cloud security posture management, which is what Divi Cloud is, cloud workload protection platforms, cloud access security brokered, uh, CASBs. Um, none of that was being used by 45% of these folks. So a shocking number, almost half of the companies that have adopted public cloud don't have a mechanism to secure it. Um, mm -hmm. what, talk to me about that. Like, I mean, yeah. What, I, I think one of the mean? big shifts, yeah, one of the big shifts, Chris, I, I think is the fact that, you know, in the traditional model, um, the, you know, the corporate information security team and compliance team in general were, were very centralized. And, you know, with this transition to cloud, it's been decentralized and democratized in a way that I think organizations and the individuals in it need to realize that everyone is responsible for security. and you know, you talked about, you know, this this fact of being ill-equipped in some cases or, you know, even an us-them mentality, and it, it just doesn't have to be that way. And I think the, the you know, some of the, the challenges there are ensuring that the information security team understands a, a broader set. In some cases, it's a retooling and skill set of understanding uh, how cloud brings some different security risks, as well as making sure that the development teams not only feel individual ownership, um, uh, that it's not going around, but creating processes that do scale, but also making sure that the right tooling in, is in place to protect everyone involved. It's 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 not a matter of of it being a, a hindrance. It should be literally a tool that helps accelerate. Yeah, and and I think you know the, the other part is that yeah, you know, there's there to your point, there's this organizational cultural shift that has to happen, and and that's on part of the IT side, which is you know IT and security have long been command and control, and mm -hmm. Um, and this really, you know, the move to cloud requires a shift in which it becomes enable and amplify, trust but verify. And yep. if if the IT and, and security professionals aren't making that shift, then you know they may not be in a position to articulate their value in such a way that then they they um, the the organization they work for is willing to actually invest in them. And and, and they are and and they're not able to articulate 
the type of investments they need. And I think that's the key that I also see is that often when we talk with with um, IT professionals, security compliance, risk governance professionals, um, they're coming to us and saying, "Hey, look, I have a huge problem. I, I'm going home at night and I'm 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 scared because I literally don't have visibility into my cloud environment. I don't know what my security posture is, uh, and I can't act on that. I can't. Yeah, none of yeah. yeah. And, and and so I go home every night and I literally worry that I'm going to walk in the next morning. So I'm going to read about my company in the news that mm -hmm. we've had a breach. And I'm going to get fired or my life is going to be hell. And it's often you know just you know it's not just how do I you know what tools to buy, but but how do I go and have the conversations with the organization um, to ju to justify this. And part of that is coming back and saying, look, these breaches matter. And yes. we're not going to- Materially. Yes, materially. Materially matter financially. And, and here's, the, here's the data. And and by the way, our job is not to slow you down. I think you always, always say it's not the culture of no, right? It's now the culture of yes, but here's how to do it securely. You and so it's it. really important, I think, for I, you know, to recognize that A, IT professionals are not being equipped to operate securely in the cloud today, and they need to be. And two, that they can be participant in that process um, in the ways we've just talked about. Um, and then the, the other thing that's pretty shocking in the data is that uh, of all the professionals surveyed, 42% did not know which frameworks their company uses to maintain compliance, security, uh, compliance with standards and regulations. So things like GDPR or HIPAA or PCI DSS, but also SOC 2, the CIS benchmarks, FedRAMP, NIST CSF, uh, NIST 853, ISO 27001, to name a few. Uh, worse yet, the number of IT professionals unaware or unfamiliar with the standards and regulations uh, to which their organization must comply actually increased 8% since last year. So, yeah. you know, if anything, this seems to be, you know, this may be driven by some new regulations, right? Things like CC, uh, CCPA out of California or GDPR, as well as, you know, things like HIPAA. But I think it's actually getting more difficult for organizations to keep track of this and ensure compliance because what you said earlier, which you said, you know, it's been democratized. You know, no yeah. longer is this being... You know our standards and frameworks, the the, um, the 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 purview of just IT and security GRC. It really now has to be the 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 purview of everyone. And so, talk to me a little bit about how how is that? I mean, like what what's that shift look like? And 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 what are you seeing in the world of, of uh, you know where you're you're consulting with all these different uh, folks like Kroger and and others? Sure. Yeah, because I, I think part of the reason is uh, you know policies and procedures in many cases just have not caught up. Uh, you know, to to really be, wouldn't call it relevant, but but to give good guidance around how to look at it through the lens of cloud. And I, but I think you know, and you mentioned it, and it is, it's it's a scary thought to think that that in many, not many, but there are there are you know certainly cases, and the data shows it, right? That not only do they know not know which framework, but in many cases they're, they're not even aware that there are frameworks that exist. And I think. You know, in traditional, uh, you know, traditional IT, some of these more compliant frameworks were were thought of as constrictive or constraining, and I, I think that that is definitely an attitude that needs to shift. I, I think that many of these frameworks are great guideposts on if you don't already have, um, you know, procedures and policies in place to look at uh, how to secure cloud-based infrastructure. They're great starting points and educational points because, in some cases, like I mentioned before folks just don't realize uh, that the configurations that they're creating are insecure. And so yeah. having these frameworks in place and, and a tool you know, like Divi Cloud that can, can actually look across those frameworks and let you know where you may have gaps in that uh, are very important. And then, you know, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll shift quickly here to talking about things we can do to sort of solve some of the things we've, we've identified as being problematic. But one of the big areas and, and, that we haven't talked about yet is that developers and security are still misaligned. Yeah. Um, and what we mean by that is that essentially, you know, when, when we did our survey, other respondents um, who confirmed their, their organization was using public cloud, only a little more than half, 58% said their organization had clear guidelines and policies in place for developers building applications and operating in the public cloud. So going back to what we just talked about, you know, you know, your, clear you know your clear guidelines and policies are often driven by these standards, right? Um, yeah. And then beyond that, 25% who said they had these policies said they aren't enforced, and 17%, um, uh, oh, and of those, sorry, of those 58% who said they had they, that um, clear gu that clear guidance were placed, 25% said they were not being enforced. So, yeah. you know, that means that, um, uh, and 17% of, of all respondents said that there were no guidelines, basically. Um, and then half of the respondents uh, who use public cloud said that developers and engineers at times ignore or circumvent cloud security and compliance policies. 
because developers often feel um, that security compliance policies will limit their ability to build and deploy new services quickly. Um, and so, you know, let's just talk about a little bit of, of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yeah, that's a that is shocking because if, mm -hmm. if what we're saying is that this has become democratized, what this means is that it really hasn't, right? That that there yeah. still is this enormous gap between what should be happening, which is that yeah, democ access to public cloud has been democratized, but it doesn't seem like security has been democratized. And what's that's created is literally a place where half of companies are essentially just flying blind, and, and it's wild, wild west. You know, how, how did that come about? What what's going on there? Well, and I think you're right. And I think to build on that a little bit is um, with the data, you know, the tr more traditional thought framework of a data center, right? You're thinking about security more from a perimeter standpoint. And and I think when it when it comes to looking at cloud-based workloads, for one, I think the individual uh, types of workloads need to be looked at differently. And we'll we'll talk a little later, I think, about uh, more from a severity standpoint. But in this case, what I'm talking about is is treating things like an innovation lab, uh, you know, a VPC that's set up for that may have very different constraints around it than a production environment, right? And so that's yeah. that means not constraining development to be innovative, which was the whole purpose of this, right? You got to think about what what the orig origination of this was to be able to drive innovation at speed. Let's not constrain the development team as long as they're not using live data back in the innovation yeah. lab. Yeah, and then begin yeah. to constrain that down through the various pipeline from innovation to dev to QA yeah. and fraud. Yeah, that's well, one of the key areas there. And, and we've always heard from our security professionals, you know, that that they that developers often say that security is a four-letter word, which I yeah. you know, which I won't say on this, but um, <laughs> and that and that you know, part of that is is just that again, you have this cultural disconnect between the two organizations, right? And and it is it's about winning hearts and minds, I think, in the new cloud world. And it goes back to what you said before, which is that if if you are an IT professional, IT security professional, you can't just continue to operate the way you did for the last Right. And you have know, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, you've got to be able to shift to align to that trust but verify, amplify and enable, uh, because you have digitally savvy business units now that mm -hmm. will will, whether you like it or not, directly access cloud. And if you are seen as a blocker, someone who's trying to command and control them, they will simply go around. And the other part is then you have to spend a lot of your time as an analyst educating them, right? Because they now have to be part of your team. And so yes. You know, if you if you haven't established a clear framework using the frameworks that exist out there, or or a corporate framework, you know, um, and you haven't educated the people uh, who are there, and you haven't changed your culture, then what you're going to find is that you are inherently going to be insecure in perpetuity, right? That there will be no there will be no security that you will be able to achieve. Well, and, I, and it, just to build on that real quickly, I think there's two additional pieces with that that blend right into that, and that one is to make sure, as you mentioned, as in becoming part of that culture is to look at actually embedding uh, some of those security resources in those development pods, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be on a per team basis, but yeah. as part of that individual organization, uh, becoming part of it to understand what they're living through on a day-to-day, -day, as well as uh, beginning to democratize that out in a cultural way. And then it, we'll talk a little later, bit later, but also shifting and moving left in the sense of when you're looking at infrastructure at code, giving real-time feedback uh, to the developers that what they're looking at doing in as they deploy those resources uh, could potentially bring harm to the organization. Yeah, and we've we've seen uh, the emergence of cloud centers of excellence, the CCOE, um, mm -hmm. at many of our, our our customers, which initially is there to try and build you know new uh, competency and capacity and capability around cloud. Uh, but really is an agile, um, you know, forcing function to organizations. And as we see them evolve, the CCOE doesn't typically disappear, but actually in many cases, you know, it starts to become a distributed um, consultancy within the organization that's mm -hmm. really talking about ability yep. and and transforming business units to, to participate in the cloud in, um, in ways that Amplify enable them securely. And so that's been a fascinating because, you know, I think for a while people thought, oh, the CCOE, that'll be around for six months, nine months, 12 months, then it'll go away, it'll get, in, it'll get sucked back in. But in fact, yeah. it's becoming a transformational organization um, that is really about transforming the way that the entire company operates um, so they can securely operate in agile frame, uh, capacity. Um, so I, I've seen that transformation be really fascinating uh, in yeah. my opinion. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about critical actions next step. So we've set up, the, let's just talk about what we said. We've, we've said cloud is accelerating, the risks were already there, the problems are manifest in, in a myriad of ways. 
but we have, you know, we've given a, bit, a few, you know, uh, uh, elements that says here's how you can try and resolve that cultural change. But let's dive into sort of if you are a, a, a security professional, if you're not a heat professional, what can you do now uh, during the middle of, of, you know, a lot of stress or at any period of stress to to take steps to to solve for these things? And the first thing I'll, I'll call out is. You know, as you embrace public cloud, and, and I'm not talking about SaaS at this point, but really around things like IaaS, um, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, functions as a service, containers as a service across Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Platform or Microsoft Azure or Alibaba Cloud, play close attention, pay close attention to a few key services. And those services are the ones that store data, right? So storage, <laughs> database, and search. And a lot of people forget search because it is, or, or, or cache even, right? Um, those those search and cache services are the ones that I think are, are often the Achilles heel for folks because they they're not they think they think a lot about storage and database but they forget all that data is being stored in the cache or in, in search and what we saw in the misconfiguration support is that you know a, a shocking number of cloud service breaches were around a small number of types of cloud resources and and then the next thing is don't forget about infrastructure as service because a lot of people say oh the future is is containers and functions and serverless and that's where all of our developers are going to go and spend their time building. And so we've really got to focus on that. Um, and and you know, IaaS is old, and it's just it's something we know because it's the same as as the virtual machines we ran in, in the data center. And the answer is no, it's not. You know, yeah. infrastructure service is not the same as data center. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons. And two, when we interview, when we surveyed folks, um, forty about what the uh, what type of architecture they would be using to build new applications, forty two percent said IaaS. 21% said serverless, 17% said containers, and 7% said platform as a service. So don't forget infrastructure as a service because it isn't, it isn't, you, you can't secure it and make it compliant like the like the data center. And two, it is still the plurality of how developers are going to be building net new applications. Um, but let me let me flip now back to you, Thomas, because you talk to me a lot about planning for the worst and knowing your blast radius. Can you walk me through what that means and how the people on the phone today can uh Get, can take that sort of the, those that this gem of wisdom from you and, and make it actionable. Sure. Uh, yeah. So it's the first piece to, to think about, and, and I mentioned a little bit earlier, is to, to think specifically about the workload itself. And so that that comes back to the actual design. Um, and as you think about blast radius, what does that mean, right? And, and you know, it's it yeah, it's a military term, but in many ways we got to think in military ways, and that is. is if a breach was to occur, how far can things reach? And it's it's looking at everything that touches that individual workload and thinking about them as a holistic system and then securing them in that way. And in some yeah. cases, right, if it's if it is an intentionally open public bucket uh, to to distribute you know sales material and other things that you want public from your company you need to think about that workload very differently than the one that create that, that make contain pci or hipaa data and how far can that that actual application and its related resources reach and those those include i mean things all the way down to the individual service accounts as in how much uh actual uh, permissions do they have and minimizing those permissions and in some cases working to time base those permissions uh, through technologies to to ensure that they only have the needed credentials for the limited amount of time that's required to actually complete yeah. that task. Yeah. Well, and I think you've talked about the, the the blast radius in cloud is really about identity and access management, right? I mean, that, it sure is. Right. That, Absolutely. You know, you, you've said this already. There is no hard perimeter anymore. You don't have firewalls. Well, you you can't have firewalls, but you don't have a a single firewall. You know, sort of you know creating a hard perimeter around your entire data center and, and you've got a single MVLS network, et cetera, with, you know, one point of, of ingestion, um, uh, egress and ingress. Um, but, um, but so in the, in the world of cloud, you know, one of the challenges we've often seen is, is, you know, is privilege, right? And, and you made the point of, uh, you know, having uh, sort of, you know, um, real-time privilege access management, right? So, so having sort of time boxes on access, but beyond that, you know, that, that's, that's hard to do on, at scale. Yeah, one of the things that we've seen is that it, you really have to be able to understand your identity access management and the layers of that in these cloud service providers. So, you know, Amazon I think has something like um, five layers of, of identity and access that that mm -hmm. can can sort of overlap. Um, and so many of our our you know our customers are not thinking about that when they first talk to us because they are um, they're very focused on sort of you know 
oh, someone can get access to this thing, but not the fact that every object, every resource has has identity and everything has uh, access associated with it. And so, you know, that that's what we often see is that you know, dive in there and really understand the identity access management world of AWS or Azure or GCP if you're using that. And certainly that's true also in in terms of SaaS. Sure. And, and to your point, it's it's not just about the individual resources in the sense that we would traditionally think of them as in people, right? It's it's all those related services that connect and talk. And in, in many cases for organizations, even, uh, you know, IoT type devices that are on the edge, what level of access do they have from a reach back perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about this right which is and we've we've touched on this a lot so i think this is really about wrapping all that up in a bow but cloud security should not be an afterthought so you know first and foremost if you are if you are in a company that is either about to embrace cloud or is in the process of that which is what most people are you you, you have to go and find an executive champion is, mm -hmm. is my opinion, um to to be the person who really sits you know either at the c level or is talking to the board and and saying we can do this, we can do both things. We can balance speed and security because too many organizations treat cloud security and governance and compliance as an afterthought. And and, and so talk to me about where have you seen, like how, how should folks be approaching that organizational dynamic so that they can get in front of this and not slow down the process, but yep. inject security in a real way. Talk, talk to me about how you've seen that in the real world and, 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 um, and what's been effective. Well, and I think we hit on it a little bit earlier, and that and that is, and you've already stated is is one finding that executive champion, and 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 I'd say specifically, uh, if you're on the the development slash production side, is is reaching back and establishing that partnership with security, and and finding that individual, and really uh he or she that you can partner with and say look we we do want to make sure that this is a partnership educating them in some cases as to why this is different and the partnership required um if if it's not already established it's it's finding a right starting point of a framework um to say look this this is the way we're going to initially measure ourselves and, I, and i'll say look even some of the, the largest firms that we work with um still in some cases had to I wouldn't say drop back and punt, but but they they thought they kind of had it together and then realized that their existing processes that they thought were going to scale didn't. And it was stepping back and saying, okay, what's the framework we're going to measure ourselves to? Partnering together, working to bring some folks over that embed into the teams to to not only be a guide, but also to feel some of the day-to-day -day activities that that you realize some of those challenges. And I think that's where you, you do balance the speed and security and making sure if, if everyone feels that, that ensuring security is, is the, the, the initial paramount critical aspect to how we're going to do this, I think folks will be much more open to reaching out, not only for help, but sometimes, you know, in the manufacturing world, pulling that end on uh, switch and saying, hey, we got we got to stop here for just a minute, reassess so that we can go even faster once we've resolved how we're going to handle this. Yeah, and I think I think the I've often seen the concern of people saying, "Well, I've got to try and still drive people through, um, you know, a, a single process, right, in order to gain yeah. access to cloud." What we know is that you know the, the access to cloud is like a river, and if you put a rock in the river, the water flows around it. it flows right, right around. And it. So, I, and we'll talk about this, and I think it's really important to um, to talk about things like pipelines, and we'll talk about that, right? You, yeah. you need to have automation. Um, and so you do want to give, uh, but you have to give optionality, right? Because, and, and you have to have, you have to have security throughout the life cycle. And yes. so, you know, it, it is about shifting le cloud security left into the you know, DevOps. So if you're using pipelines, if you're not using pipelines, please think about using them, but yes. you can't assume everyone's going to be using pipelines. So you've got to not only have security, rigorous security components that are integrated with where the developer exists. So in things like DevOps, um, whether that's in the IDE or whether it's in the, in the CI/CD tool, tooling, um, you should be using things like infrastructure, uh, infrastructure as code because that yes. provides you, you, you elements. Um, so if you're not doing that, please do because th then none of this is afterthought. Right now, you're injecting security and resiliency and, and well-designed architects and frameworks into the actual DevOps process. So that's all really important. But but assume that not everyone's going to use those things that you're providing. That not everyone's going to use pipelines. Not everyone's going to use IDEs, not everyone's going to use that are integrated, and not everyone's going to use uh, IAC, infrastructure as code. Um, but then beyond that, 
that you then have to have something that's catching all those things at runtime, right? So you have sort of exactly. the, the pre it is, it is It yep. is the full development life cycle. You're right, Chris. I mean, you, you really, it's not only upon resource creation, it's that long-term. I mean, many, just many enterprise clients, and you brought it up earlier, it's not just about those new innovative technologies, as, you know, of just, you know, code as a service you are going to have a lot of COTS based type applications that are running on some long-standing infrastructure and you have to be able to monitor it long term and ensure that configuration drift doesn't occur that can cause yeah. a different security risk in runtime yeah full life cycle continuous um, yes well, well let's talk and then I, you know, let's talk about focus on risk not threats and here, here's what i was thinking about threat threats and threat actors are, are first of all at, at an all-time high right now i mean you, you have just an enormous amount of exploitation occurring because of all the of, of, of the stress we're under and, and you have state actors who are very sophisticated large organized crime that's very sophisticated and then everybody you know who's maybe got a, a connection in their you know to the internet you know and, and is able to to try and be disruptive and that the challenge is that those threats are constantly evolving and shifting and trying to keep up with them is is, is um, first of all impossible uh, and and mm -hmm. second of all um, uh, like a game of whack-a-mole. And, and so from that perspective, I've always believed in my 20-year career in, in, in IT and security that you focus on the risk, the underlying things that a threat actor could take advantage of. Because trying to, to stop every new threat vector is just, again, incredibly problematic because they change daily. So you're constantly trying to do a day zero uh, and you're always going to be behind the, the eight ball. Instead, my belief has always been how do you get in and focus on the underlying risk that will be exploited? And we talked about this earlier. Yeah, you wanted to, I'm going to go through a quick list and then let's talk about it for a moment. You know, yeah. Identify excessive and unused permissions. Number one thing in cloud. It, you know, that is the risk and the threat actors will take advantage of that. And that, you know, if you think about the Capital One um, breach that occurred, if they, that was that was the key under, underpinning element. There was excessive and unused permissions that should have been removed. And we're not. Detect publicly exposed assets. Going back to what we said earlier. There are specific types of, of cloud resources that store data if they are publicly exposed um, and, and, and not intentionally, that is usually problematic. Have harder security configurations. So that goes back to what we said. And, and, and by the way, implement those during the pipeline, but then pers you know, uh, make sure they are continuously being monitored and, and, uh, and persisted throughout the lifetime of, of the cloud resource or cloud service. Secure APIs. Um, and then really automate, 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 right? Because mm -hmm. uh, because that's the thing. And I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back over to you shortly on, on the next slide for for a discussion on that. When we think about automation, um, talk to me a little. Bit. I know it sounds cliche because everyone always says you should automate, but in this world of misconfigurations, in this world in which we are at trying to create full lifecycle, walk me through a little bit about how someone automates from sort of cradle to to quote unquote grave in 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 the world of 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 cloud security. Sure, and I think the, the big thing is, is to your point, Chris, everyone talks about it so much that I, I think it gets blurred over into one, feeling overwhelming, and, and two, um, feeling like in many ways that it's just not attainable. And I think the big thing is, is understanding that you have to start somewhere, um, it, and it doesn't have to be big bang. It's It's something that can literally be yeah, you know, obviously you, you want. We talked about it a little earlier. Is you want to begin with the end in mind that security should be the you know foremost aspect and thought, and integrating that into the process. But I, I think the first off is realizing that you do need to treat it as a full life cycle, all the way from conception, design, inception of a pipeline and code, all the way through runtime, and retirement. And I think you touched on one of the things too is 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 that you, you, there's this high potential for orphaned resources, whether they're orphaned public IPs that are unconnected, um, workloads that and data that's just you know been left out there and those need to be cleaned up. And, and there's ways to to certainly automate some of that cleanup. But I, I think it's it's one starting uh, back at the uh, at the design phase. Uh, once those Lego bricks that are determined to be secure are created, you begin, uh, looking at incorporating those into a library that can be drawn upon into your pipeline. It's having pipeline checks, if possible, to actually go ahead and almost run a pre-flight of what that uh, what that workload is going to look like once deployed, and does it meet the required compliance that the, the organization has put in place? It means 
having a strategy around identifying what workloads are running what types of data, whether those you should have a data classification policy as to what types of data they are from the utmost secure to public, uh, because that, that helps you understand the threat related back to that blast radius that we talked about. Um, but then it's it's harvesting back and having visibility to how those resources are configured and then having the automation in place that can remediate if it, those those uh, resources or workloads or uh, permissions in the IAM policy go against the standard. Yeah, that and let's and I think all let's talk about what that benefits you, right? I mean, first it saves time. Yeah, sure. Right? Humans are no longer needed to react, take action manually, and I think this is important. You know, the, the actions that are performed automatically, allowing people to focus on the high value add tasks, right? That often. You know, automation is not about taking the human out of it. I think people often are thinking autonomous where machines are making decisions. Automation is about enabling scale and re and, and repetition and consistency of process. And I think that's right. the thing that, that you imagine that, in, you know, as an example, in the world of Divi Cloud, we've written this four levels of automation um, document that has the four levels defined. And if you're, if you're, if you're struggling on how to get automation, go take a look at it. Um, it's, it's on our website. We'll give you the, the URL at the end here. But um, yeah, you know, this is a really great way for people to, to understand there is you can walk your way into automation in the beginning is often just taking care of the things that would be the, what would be doing manually and couldn't happen without at scale. And then at the very end, you start doing really sort of more classic stuff where it's it's actually having, you know, reconfiguring cloud services to make them secure. But often it's about, you know, automation of messaging and, and logging um, and uh, ticketing and notifications. Um, so saving time. You know, big one to your point, sure. improving security, right? Because you're if you're doing things with automation, you're 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 addressing things immediately. You're you're kicking off workflows uh, immediately. Consistency, we just talked about that, um, and con and continuous. I mean, the problem is if you're yeah. doing things manually, then you are doing it manually, and it becomes a periodic effort in which a person has to be involved. Whereas if you're automating, it is now a continuous effort that does not require a person to be awake 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, so, uh, so I think that, you know, my opinion is that, you know, if you are driving towards cloud, you have to be embracing automation or you simply won't survive. And I think that's, that's the big takeaway, which is that, and you can do this, by the way, using scripts, you don't have to go buy a bunch of tools. Um, I think, you know, there certainly is an argument to be made that, that tools like Divi Cloud are, are available to you and, and provide a scalable enterprise grade approach to, to doing uh, automation around uh, cloud security and shifting that left into infrastructure as code during the CI/CD pipeline, for example. But um, and while also at runtime, but but you know, start start small if you need to, um, but do automation today to start to to allow yourself to scale. Um, any last tips? Otherwise, uh, Thomas, I think we can we can start transitioning over to uh, to Q and A with with the folks on the line. Yeah, no, I, I the I think the only thing that I, I'd add to to that last statement is. You know, you're absolutely right. You, you you know, there are things you can do through scripting and others. Um, in my experience, what I've seen is ultimately most larger organizations will have some aspect and facet of multi-cloud. And I, I think too many folks feel like if if they have one aspect covered through some of those, um, you know the, the the tools of the of the provider that they that they have all their bases covered, and I, I think having having a, a platform that that drives across that provides a unified platform for automation is is critical and key, and I, and I think it's it's one that should certainly be evaluated. You can start with scripting, but as you begin to scale, you need something that's going to provide that uh, that end to end view as well as remediation. So cool. So thank you, Thomas. I appreciate you taking the time to talk through everything we've we've seen here today. Um, Gladly. You know, as I said, you know, we we talked a lot about a, a number of resources. These are all available to you at divicloudcom slash threat post, the 2020 State of Enterprise Cloud and Container Adoption Security Report, the 2020 Cloud Misconfiguration Support, and last but not least, the four levels of automated remediation. If you're looking for data uh, to drive conversations at an executive level. Um, or just to help you understand the risk, um, the world of risk in cloud. Uh, you know, those two first uh, reports are, are fantastic uh, resources, uh, and the last one is really helpful for the automation. 
Um, with that, I think I'll, I'll hand it back to our uh, amazing moderator for, uh, for the Q&A session. Great, thanks so much, Chris. And Thomas, I appreciate it. Gladly. Um, okay, so so yes, we're gonna move into the Q&A portion of the proceedings. I'd just like to remind everybody on the phone um, that we do have time for questions. And so there's a widget on the right-hand side of your screen where you can submit any that happen to come to mind and uh, we will get as many as possible. Um, we do have some already in the queue, guys. Um, first of all, uh, this person would like to know uh, with all the problems that have been publicized around the Zoom platform and uh, Google Meet and some of the other uh, work from home strategy um, cloud applications that, that companies have been using. Um, security wise, uh, what do we do for our employees who are forced to work from home but who may not have the best practices while they're uh, using these applications? Thomas, you, you want to take that one? Sure. I think to start off, uh, as so as we've seen in the many news reports, right? So many folks, and I and I hate to say this, but when they're when they're unaware of the risk that they're they're actually creating, they'll utilize products straight out of the box. And and while that may meet the the need of the the consumer based on what they're doing, when we're dealing with company transactions and information that's being described, you, you at least need to, particularly with SaaS based applications. Um, ensure that you're not accepting it straight out of the box and begin to implement things like forced passwords on on zoom meetings and others and i, I think that's just one simple simple approach to at least start on that but as we take one step back from some of those technologies that we're rushing into to to support this uh you know the, the pandemic and working from home simple not simple but but look critical fairly table stake items around making sure where possible implement, implementing multi-factor uh, double checking all configurations back to things related to things like VPN connections and others are just so critical to ensure those steps but it also comes down to educating uh, we talked a lot about earlier about the phishing right that's going to continue to go on it, it will always be an important attack vector and you can certainly do phishing campaigns where you not only you know internally fish out to folks and I, i'm not a huge fan of it because i feel like you're trying to trick folks but it does show a point of education and reminding folks that they need to be careful on where they're getting their information and how they link back to it but chris something to add to that i think that's spot on yeah cool okay great thanks guys um okay so another question is uh what are the best cloud service options to store or to safely store rather uh clinical um image files for example um assuming that this person is referring to maybe healthcare data something like that um according to fhir hl7 standards or any other safe solutions to store clinical big data imaging um is what this person is asking very, very specific question. Very interesting. Yes, um, it is very specific. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think the answer is, I mean, certainly you can, you know, depending on how you're going to store these things, you'll probably, you know, I imagine they're quite large in your files, so you're probably not going to store them in a database, but you're probably going to reference them in a in some sort of file system. Uh, you know, all the cloud services are very secure if they are configured appropriately. Um, you know, so you know, there's never been a breach because a cloud service provider was insecure. The breaches occur because the cloud service provider, uh, the cloud service has been operated insecurely by the organization consuming the cloud services. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we want to dispel the rumor that cloud is insecure, right? Cloud is incredibly secure. It's probably more secure than most data centers because it's being run at such scale with such automation and um, and expertise that it just it is it is secure, very very secure. Um, so you know, you have your choice of of cloud service providers, whether that's Amazon or Microsoft or Google, um, and you your choice of storage services, and all of those um, can be operated securely. But that's the key: is that you have to think about what that operation looks like. Now, there are requirements around ensuring that the cloud service that you're using um, is, let's say, HIPAA or high tech uh, uh, compliant and certified, and, and the cloud service providers do publish that information as well. So you can go in and see, you know, what are what 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 services are HIPAA compliant or high tech compliant, um, and then beyond that, uh, you want to then apply a product like Divi Cloud, frankly, that can monitor the configuration of all those services against those same standards and how you are operating it, because you know, there you have a shared responsibility model in the cloud. 
the, the cloud go. service provider agrees to to secure their side of things, but you have to agree to operate their cloud in a secure fashion. So if you want to be HIPAA compliant, for example, not only do you have to have a, a HIPAA compliant service from the cloud service provider, but you have to operate in a HIPAA compliant way. And that means things like logging has to be enabled and, and, and you know, encryption has to be used and, um, uh, and public access has to be uh, controlled and all these sort of, of, of facets that are defined within these, these standards. Um, and so that's really where, frankly, we often help our customers because they are at a crossroads where they're saying, I have to move to cloud. Um, I understand that as a shared responsibility, how do I operate securely on my side of the shared responsibility equation? And that's where we really come in and automate that process for them. Uh, Thomas, did I, did I miss anything there? No, spot on. It is. It's that shared responsibility model and, and ensuring that you you choose the, the provider that meets it and then ensure that you're operating it in a way that keeps keeps you secure. Okay, great. Um, we also have another question about frameworks, which you guys had uh, mentioned some of these earlier in the presentation. Um, but are there any specific frameworks or tools or techniques on how to check cloud security in a company step by step? Um, I think this person is, is wondering if uh, there's a checklist basically where you can go from the smaller tips and tricks to you know getting down to the real serious security tasks. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first step and I'll throw it to Thomas. I mean, look, when, when we sure. go and talk to groups like Amazon or Microsoft or Google, the first thing they will say is uh, take a look at the CIS benchmarks that they publish, that each of these, these cloud service providers publish, right? Because that is their baseline. So as, as a starting point, you know, certainly consume the baseline that the cloud service providers themselves have published. Um, you know, the challenge of that baseline is always how do you operationalize these? And that's where you know, frankly, products like Devi Cloud come in, but but those are the baselines you should be starting with. Um, and then beyond that, I think there's a, 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 a you know a number of useful standards that you can layer on on top of those. And, and I'll turn that over to, to Thomas to give his opinion on on those. Yeah, I, spot on. I think you definitely definitely start with CIS. Um, NIST is a, is another one to take a look at. Um, but then Dr. you start. Are you, are you thinking NIST CSF, the cybersecurity framework? Or are you thinking you got it. Or, or or both of those? Well, both. I think both are great starting points, uh, along with with CIS. Uh, the CSF one is is one is another great one to start. But, but again, utilizing those as a, a guidepost and framework uh, to to start from. And then there's a number of other industry specific ones that that the team should begin to evaluate. The great part is is you can begin to then come because there are overlapping requirements. Um, it can turn into a customized pack that's more specific to your enterprise. Uh, that you can then begin to feel, you know, that those resources are compliant both to that initial framework that the provider would use as well as an industry-specific one. And, and then additionally, you know, you can begin to fold in some requirements that may be specific to your own and have visibility to those also. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we have time for, for one more quick question. Um, in the event of a data breach, what is the high-level incident response process that you would recommend? Chris, you want to grab it? Uh, why don't you take the first tab and then I'll, and I'll follow up. Sure, sure. No, I, I think this one is pretty straightforward in the sense that, look, once it's detected, you, you definitely got to stop it as quickly as possible. Uh, you want to collect all related artifacts. Uh, so taking a snapshot of the environment, the instances, uh, any logging that's related to it so that you can go through and look at the forensics of what happened. You certainly want to assess the damage, uh, thinking about that blast radius, right, as to how far did it potentially reach that you didn't miss anything in the analysis. And then you're going to have to follow your, you know, your response and disclosure plans. And it, if you don't have one, you definitely do need one. Um, and making sure that, uh, you know, that includes customers and others to, to notify the right folks, but, uh, and then learn from it. That's the big thing is to learn from it and make sure it doesn't occur again. Yeah, agreed. Okay, great. Well, guys, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, okay. I just wanted to uh, let our audience know that if any questions come to you or if you want to otherwise communicate with the panel, um, please feel free to email me directly and I'll make sure that, that uh, those queries get routed. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending our ThreatPost webinar. I'd like to thank Divi Cloud for sponsoring our event today. Um, thanks to Chris and Thomas for participating. And uh, we hope to see everybody on future Thread Post webinars. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everybody.